online family and friends. We are so glad that you can join us today. We trust God that you and your loved ones are well and safe. We are place of victory for all nations Belfast and our mission is to transform lives and influence changes. So if you are here for the first time, let me reassure you, it did not happen by accident. You are here to be renewed 
you are here to be empowered in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. As we are moving to the worship, I will suggest, turn up the volume, get up on your feet, and sing along with us to praise our God Almighty. And I pray that we are all going to be blessed as we worship Him. In Jesus' mighty name.
deserve our worship, oh God. Hallelujah. today that you accept our worship and our praise, O oh God. We thank you because you are indeed the beginning and the end, O oh God. Be thou exalted, O oh God, be thou glorified, for in Jesus' name we've worshipped. Amen. As we are moving into prayer time, we will begin to pray for persecuted church and Christians in Kenya. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 6 says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, 
for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Lord, I pray for the unity and collaboration among those serving Christians converts from Islam. I pray that young people will follow our Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone and reject all worldly ideologists. I pray that churches in Kenya will remain strong as they are facing Islamic attacks. I pray for the protection and unity among Christian minorities. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. We are living in unprecedented times caused by COVID-19. That is why we should pray for the healing of our nation. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, the Bible says, It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Lord, we pray that by your grace, you will lead your nation to the healing tree. Almighty and everlasting Father, the King of Kings, have mercy on your nation and forgive us sins and trespasses. Jehovah Rapha, we call upon your name to heal our land, to heal our nation in this pandemic. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. We are all aware and affected by the worldwide Black Lives Matter movement. That is why we should call upon our Lord, the Jehovah Shalom, the King of Peace, to bring unity within us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. God, we need you like never before. We ask for your help to set aside our differences and to look up to you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you help us to truly live the life of love. We ask that you surround this country and the whole world and cover us with your mighty hand. We pray for unity in our land, that despite our differences, we will be standing strong together and live our days with compassion and grace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord Church. When we think about worship, our minds turn into the music and songs which we sing together. Yet there's much more to it than the music alone. We can worship by our prayer and by our giving. When we give back to God, we are expressing our trust in Him and in His provision. We will take our tithes, which is 10% of any income God has blessed us with, and yet offering. That's another way to show our gratitude to our Lord Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 17, the Bible says, All must give as they are able, according to the blessings given to them by the Lord your God. On the screen, you will see all details in which you can give back to the Lord. There are many ways to pay your tithes and offering, either by bank transfer, standing order, or directly through our app. We will also encourage you to donate to the Church Building Fund. Details are on the screen. Father God, you are the giver of all good things 
and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. We give freely and not from compulsion, for there is nothing we could give that matches your glory and majesty and the great gift of your Son, Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit, which guide us daily. All we have is yours, Father, and we ask that you would use us and all we have as you will. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless you. I'm in debt. I have two car payments, four years into a 30-year mortgage, balances on a couple credit cards, plus college for three kids on the horizon, zero savings. I work long hours at a job that I hate, and despite all that, all I get is stress about how I can make more money. I take four pills at night for my back pain. Some days, getting up seems like too much. I struggle with dyslexia. I have high cholesterol. I overeat a little too often. I'm trying to get in shape, but it's never, I mean never enough. My dad died five years ago from cancer. I should have seen him more before he passed. Man, I miss him so much. Everyone expects me to be over it, but it's something that I still deal with daily. I haven't taken my wife on a date in four months. I practically forgot our anniversary. My kids need me when I get home, but it's late. And I want to sleep. I spend my weekends at their functions, as if that's enough. All this, and I still resent my family, because I have no time just for me. I can be amazingly selfish. I'm often angry, seemingly, for no reason. I struggle with lustful thoughts, none of which my wife understands, nor do I, for that matter. I'm good at some things, I'm great at nothing. I had dreams for my work and my family, and I abandoned them long ago. I think I'm a realist, and I come off as a pessimist. I feel restless knowing something is missing. I have too many burdens. They're suffocating. And this is the weight I carry. Hello and welcome friends. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're keeping well and I pray for God's continued protection over you and your loved ones. Last week we celebrated Father's Day and we of course explored fatherhood, the theme of fatherhood. Fatherhood is certainly a very important topic that cannot be exhausted in one single day and so we will continue to explore it and as regularly as the Lord leads us to the topic. Last week we started by defining fatherhood as simpler the state of being a father, we noted that the concept of fatherhood is beyond the biological capability of a man to produce a child. Fatherhood is more about of the function and the role of a father in preparing, positioning, and empowering the next generation. Within the context of a home, I would like to use this opportunity um, to acknowledge the partnership that mothers have with fathers in preparing, positioning, and empowering the next generation. In last week's sermon, I noted the dichotomy of public success and private failure that we see in some fathers in the scripture, which is also a reality in our own time. And this provoked the question and the title of the sermon, Where Are the Fathers? I then started to draw for us an image of a true father by looking at the scriptures, particularly the Old Testament. This week, I want to continue to um, explore that image and also begin to answer the question, where are the fathers, by sharing with you some of the battles that we fight. I therefore title this message, The Battles Men Fight. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm aware of the pain and discomfort and emotions that certain topics can evoke for some people and fatherhood is one of such. I therefore wish to start again this sermon um, by praying. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, because you ultimately are our Father and you are ever faithful. Again, we ask you to please comfort and continue to uphold all the families that have lost their fathers, particularly recently, where the wound of bereavement is still very sore. Again, we ask you in your mercy and grace that you should fill the gaping hole that they left behind. 
and you are the only one that can feel this. And so we ask that in the name of Jesus, that you feel this gaping hole. We pray for mothers who have had to perform the function of mother and father at the same time. Bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, and send them help in Jesus' name. For those who, for one reason or the other, have not experienced the presence of a earthly father, please help them bear the pain and raise step in, Father, for them here on earth. Thank you, Almighty God. Now, O oh Lord, in the name that is above every name, I pray for the grace to speak your word in Jesus' most gracious and wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, someone. Hallelujah. Of course, the Bible is replete with stories of many fathers. But in a way, you could look at it as a tale of a father and two sons. The Old Testament can be seen as the picture of how a father remained faithful to a wayward son, Israel. And the New Testament is a tale of a father and his faithful son, the only begotten of the father, Jesus Christ. When we read Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter, chapter 13, verse 33b, um, it is also written in the second Psalms, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. In the KJV, I believe it says, You are my son, today I have become your father. The disciples, Apostle Paul, was referring to Psalms 2 verse 7. In both tales, the father remained faithful to both sons. With God being the perfect father, we look to him and his word to give us a clearer image um, of what a father, a true father should be. And so as we begin to look in this first segment, I want us to continue where we stopped last week as we explored the image of a true father. When we look at fatherhood in the Old Testament, we saw the father, last week we looked at it, we saw the father as a director, a friend, a caregiver, and husband. Today, today, as we explore the New Testament, we will see uh, the image of an ever-present father, an encourager, one who helps in the identity formation of the child, and also one who empowers his child. I take my text from Matthew chapter 3 from verse 13 to verse 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to verse 17. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the river Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to tuck him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized of you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all the Father requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. May the Lord bless the reading of his words. Amen. And so what we saw before our eyes was the, was the, the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, there are, it appears that it was only John who experienced that. But nonetheless, a voice came out and, and John heard the voice and John saw. And so as we explore uh, this passage, we would see the image of a father before our eyes. Um, in this, in the New Testament, we see another son, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of, of the Father, John 1, 14, the only begotten of the Father. In complete contrast to the Old Testament, this son was neither unfaithful nor stubborn like Israel was. We see again the faithfulness of God in the bond of love and care for the son. Let's explore for them. You see, aside from the incident where Jesus, at 12 years old, was left behind in the temple, when his earthly parents went to Jerusalem to worship, the Bible is largely silent about Jesus' early life. And so we don't have a much practical account of the fatherhood of God at this stage of his life. However, 
there is one important episode that revealed for us the fatherhood of God as he cares for his only begotten son. Of course, the episode that I'm referring to is the baptism that we just read, the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. This passage reveals to us the following. Number one, number one, a present father. Reveals to us a present father. You see, uh, a, a eager son who wants to please his father um, does all that the father requires of him. That's what we saw the Bible says Jesus said we ought to do everything that God uh, requires of us. And this for me reveals a relationship the, between the father and the son. Children often want to please their fathers. Preschoolers will go home, uh, go to school. And long to come back and show daddy and mommy what they did. This, there is this yearning. There is this yearning in innocent children. To come home and show their parents what they've done. There's this yearning in, in innocent children to please their fathers, their parents. We see in this passage a father who is also present. As busy as God is in upholding the universe and doing all that he does as God, he made himself available and was present at one of the most important days in the life of a son, the baptism of a son. Folks, uh, can, can we make ourselves available and present? Fathers, I know that we have to go to work. We have to go get the bacon. I, I know we have to travel for work and we are busy. And some fathers are engaged in the business of nation building. I get it. But can we make ourselves available? For example, make ourselves available at these, um, at the important milestones of our children's life. Because you see, it leaves an indelible mark on their consciousness and, and their memories. Here is another ask. Here is another ask. Can we, I mean, beyond being present uh, during the celebration of our milestones, such as birthdays, graduation, um, we must also endeavor to be present at the dinner table and be engaged. The quality of the conversation taking place will have a phenomenal quality effect on the development of the child. You see, the dinner table is where real talk takes place. It is at the dinner table that you discover what is going on in the lives of our children. We discover what's going on in the lives of our children. At the dinner table, we get to know their friends, the name of their friends, and we get to know who is influencing our children. Uh, that this conversation, folks, go a long way in their identity formation. Amen. The second thing I see in this passage is public affirmation public affirmation public affirmation god the father came and affirmed his son earlier on i mentioned the preschoolers they love to come home to show to come home to show their parents what they achieved in school you see a child looking to please ease um ease our parents yearn for public affirmation from their parents and that is exactly what god did here god the father gave his son public affirmation. In the passage, God manifested himself and affirmed his son. He said, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. Mothers are often better with public show of affection and affirmation. Fathers, we need to take a cue from God or Father and publicly affirm our children. Number three, you see, this statement, this is my dearly beloved son, which brings me great joy, speaks to the point of identity and identity formation. God made a very affirming statement. He said, this is my son. And the son who knew his father drew his identity from his father. So some of the agitation that we witness in the lives of young people can be traced back to the lack of proper um, identity formation from the absence of either a father at home or a father figure. Fathers and father figures alike um, in the community um, are instrumental in identi identity formation of a young person. David Berner, a psychologist and author of the book The Gift of Being Yourself, 
there he defined identity as that which we experience ourselves to be. Identity is defined as that which we experience ourselves to be. Experience goes a long way in forming our identity. Whether it be, not be our experience in the relationship we have or the culture in the world around us. And so as fathers, uh, we must be present in those experiences that our children have as it helps them to form their identity. The baptism of Jesus was not just an event or a milestone for Jesus, but it was a transition period for Jesus. It was transitioning into ministry. Transition period periods are important seasons in our lives. Sometimes we find adults who never transition from childhood to adulthood in their way of thinking, talking, and reasoning. Paul explain in his transition in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 Paul said when I was a child I spoke and taught and reasoned as a child but when I grew up I put away childish things we must be present in the transition periods of our children too Helping the next generation to transition well. Helping them to reason as adults and helping them to put away charges, childish things. That requires mentorship and presence. Number four, number four, um, I titled that empowerment and recommendation. One of the responsibilities of fathers is empowerment. It is the role of fathers to empower the next generation, providing a very robust platform for them to stand securely. Um, in this passage, God the Father did exactly that. The Bible says that he empowered his son. He empowered his son. The writer of the, of the book of Acts put it succinctly in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10 verse 38. It says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and with power. Then Jesus went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. God was with him. In the biblical account of John, of, of Jesus and Peter, James and John on the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration, God yet affirmed his son and commended his son to Peter, James and John. He commended his son to Peter, James and John. He empowered the son. And he commend a son. Recommendation. In Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9 verse 35, Luke chapter 9 verse 35, the Bible says, Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Recently, one influential uh, man that I know who had access to uh, some policy making bodies was invited to a strategic meeting. Um, he went along with one of his protege and, and said to the people, he said, you need to listen to him and not me. The young man spoke and after the end of the meeting, um, the young man was invited to contribute um, and work with this uh, huge policy making buddy. Folks, it is the job of this current generation to empower, to mentor, be there, shape the life of the, the current generation and also bust open the door so that they can come in and sit on the table. And we do that by recommending them. And may the Lord help us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. In this second segment, I want to begin to explore some of the reasons why we are not present or present but absent. I'm not looking for excuses, neither am I asking men to resign to defeat. There is a way of escape, which I will later discuss. As men, we are embroiled in many battles. Uh, in some of these battles, the truth is that the odds are stacked up against us. I simply, I'm simply, I'm simply telling it as it is. For some of us, the battle started well before we were born. If you think that that's too far-fetched, ask Jacob, who was in a struggle with his twin brother in the womb. He was in a struggle, in a battle for dominance. And some of us men are so competitive that we want to win at all costs. We want power and authority so much 
that we don't care who we rob to get it. Some men will rob a blind man. Jacob deceived this old man who was blind to get his hands on the blessing and perhaps to dominate his brother. Read um, Genesis chapter 27, Genesis chapter 27, verse 37, the Bible says, And Isaac answered and said unto his brother Esau, said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him, referring to Jacob, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servant, and with corn and wine have I sustained him, and what shall I do unto thee, my son? The Lord's blessing church upon any man is not for lording it over another person or in fact a people group. It is men who have not been regenerated, men who are weak that end up abusing power, authority, or even the blessings of God. Jacob, who had sowed the seed of deception, now has the odds stack up against him as he must now live his life reaping the harvest of deception. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7 talks about Israel sowing to the wind and reaping a whirlwind. A little wonder that Jacob kept being deceived <clears throat> by Laban, his father-in-law. Folks, we, we get involved in, in the battle for dominance we end up sowing seeds that we later begin to reap. And when we begin to reap the seeds, it becomes a, a big struggle, a big battle for us to try and overcome. Uh, and may the Lord help us, even us, uh, may the Lord make a way of escape for us in Jesus' name. Another battle that I want to quickly talk about, another battle that we men are embroiled in, is this battle for progress. And, and, and let me say to you, for some of us, um, this battle began even when we were a child and, and and due to no fault of our own we engage we are engaged in battles like this take the story of jonathan's son mephibosheth the bible says he was crippled as a child he was five years old when the nurse who looked after him dropped him as the fled when they heard about the battle of the death of his father and grandfather in a battle he became crippled and his battle for mobility began at the tender, tender age of five years. From that time, Mephibosheth had to be carried. He depended on people for movement in life. Just like Mephibosheth, some men, uh, metaphorically speaking, have to struggle through life, depending on people for every movement and substantial progress in life. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, Tells us that Tori 2 Samuel chapter 4 verse 4. The Bible says Son's, Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. The battle for progress. Some men struggle in life to make any substantial progress. And it all started when they were young. They weren't given the right opportunity. They weren't given the right education. They were not mentored well. No, ex um, no experiential uh, knowledge passed to them from the previous generation. And so odds are stacked up against them. And the struggle in life to make any Edway. My God. Another battle that we fight as men is the battle of unusual appetite. I call it a battle for unusual appetite. David developed an unusual appetite for what belonged to another man. When from the root, rooftop of his palace, he feasted his eyes on the nakedness of Bathsheba. He developed an, an evil on an unusual appetite for Uriah's wife. He had to have her. He had to have her. We open ourselves to these battles. Whether the image are real life or online. Whilst I'm not making excuses. The reality is that when he feasted his eyes on that woman. The odds were stacked up against them. As they battled. 
against this urge that he had. And if you read the scriptures, David ended up killing Uriah just because he had enough fear. He ended up abusing his power. He ought to be the defender of Israel. But the very people he ought to be defending, the Bible says, he killed Uriah, sent him to battle and had him killed. Some men simply abuse because they themselves were victims of abuse when they were young. And instead of opening up to someone and, and, and seeking counsel and, and targeted prayer to obtain victory over these battles, we sometimes keep it quiet. We keep quiet and keep it a secret. Folks, to make matter worse, sometimes we look in the wrong places for help. For example, when we are stressed from the battles of life, we turn to substance to relieve us of stress and we end up abusing substances and compounding the issue. So men uh, turn to relationship outside their marital home looking for solace, but end up complicating the matter. I want to begin to conclude now. These are just handful, just these are just a handful of the battles that we fight, and inadvertently, some fathers have passed the battle on to the next generation instead of winning the battle and helping the next generation onto a better footing in life. So some of us have not been present, and some of us we are present but absent. I remember one day after recently after finishing a meal, and as I stood up to leave and to attend to um, various things, one of my daughters said to me, said, Daddy, come back, come back, come back and let us talk. Some of us refuse to give public affirmation to our children. Come back and let us talk. Can I use this opportunity to advise us fathers? I know we have to attend to many other things. I know, I know we have to attend to the meetings. We have to attend to the emails. We have to strike that business deal. But when, when we spend time to eat together, perhaps it's an opportunity for us to pause and talk with our children and talk with our wives. Some of us refuse to give public affirmation to our children. As fathers, we ought to be present. While some harsh realities of life sometimes lead to the breakdown of relationship between the father and the mother, we must endeavor, however, to be present in the life of our children, the next generation. We must affirm them. We must help them to um, in the identity uh, formation by sharing powerful experiences with them. We must empower them through education, mentorship, and bust open doors for them. I conclude by reminding every adult of the intrinsic responsibility of fatherhood and the crucial role the fathers play, uh, the, the crucial role a father plays in the development of the next generation. You may not um, have been metaphorically lifted up yourself when you were younger. You may have had to fight to con conquer many lands. Um, that were not conquered for you by the previous generation. But please hold on to the ground that you've conquered, you've occupied, and empower the next generation. Let, let me conclude by making some practical steps in making our presence felt so that we will not be asked or we will not be asked the question, where are the fathers? Number one, number one, be present. Being present by being relevant in the life of the next generation, whether it's your biological child or children or group of people that look up to you for mentorship. Number two, fathers, be very aware of the fact that you are being watched, whether it is um, in your homes or in the community that you belong to. As you know, children learn best as they observe. Your sons and daughters are watching you. They're watching you the way that you care and respect for women in your lives, your wives, your mother, your sister, the women in the community that you belong to. Number three, be present to teach and to share your life experience and skills. You, you can volunteer by either uh, teaching your skills or using your skills and talent in bridging the gap and speaking to the lives of the next generation. Teach younger men how to nurture and care for women. Fathers, 
Teach the next generation the value of work and integrity. Teach them the value of money and how to be financially free. Teach them how to fight battles and not lose ground. Number four, don't just be seen. Yeah, yeah. But let your voice be heard. Remember, in the passage, Matthew chapter 3, we heard the voice of God, the Father. Finally, be at peace with yourself as a man. And as much as lies, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Guard your heart. Because the Bible says, out of it flows the issue of life. And what flows out of the fathers ought to be a blessing to all. Earlier, I noted that there is a way of escape for every man or woman engaged in a battle right now. God is a father who makes a way of escape. When David was in a battle with Goliath, he had a good sense to involve God. The battle, in that battle against Goliath, the odds were stacked up against him. He engaged God. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, I'm going to read it in two translations. The first one, the Amplified Translation, it says, No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. Nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with temptation, he, as in the past, and is now and will always provide a way out as well. So that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. In the New Living Translation, it says simply, the temptations of your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. It will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. If you are listening to me right now and you need a way out, I can show you a way out. You see, Thomas, who himself was battling doubt, he was battling doubt, said to Jesus one time in John chapter 14, John chapter 4, 14, verse 6, he said, Lord, said Thomas, Thomas, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, folks, is the way the truth and life. Jesus is the way of escape. Jesus is the way of escape. If you sense the need to make right with God and to come into a relationship with him, you are battle tired and you want a way of escape. You want an ally. Jesus is your ally. Jesus is your way of escape. And Jesus will, in, in the name of Jesus, in his name, he will help you. And so if you sense that need to, to make right with him, to come into a relationship, to have him as your ally, you need to first acknowledge your wrongdoing and be willing to forsake the ways of life that are not in line with the principles of God. And so I want you to pray with me. I want you to repeat after me. But before that, let me say this prayer ahead of your prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you give much grace. You are the one who... Um, have moved your sons and daughters to this point where they are now looking to you for help. And so I ask in the name of Jesus that that which you're about to, to start in their lives now, that you will complete and you will establish them in faith. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. I mean, I want you to repeat these words after me. You say, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you for forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turned from my sins and I invite you to come into my life and heart. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and my Savior and my Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Praise God. And let me uh, close us all in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We pray for the grace to be present in the life of our children and those that you have given us responsibility for. We pray for this grace that we will be present, influential, 
in the lives of those of our children and those that look to us even for mentorship. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we fight the battle of life, in the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus, we will not be defeated. Make us victorious in the name of Jesus. As we read in the scripture, make a way of escape for us in the name of Jesus. My Lord and my God, even now, I decree and I declare over someone watching right now, someone that who's on broad in a battle, I pray that you will never be defeated in the name of Jesus as you make heaven your ally. Oh Lord, Almighty God, I declare we will not be defeated in the battle of life. Almighty God, make all grace available to us that we will fight and we will fight valiantly in the name of Jesus. We would emerge victoriously in the name of Jesus. Father, we trust you because you are a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything we can ever hope or think of in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray for those who are battle weary, tired from battle. Lord, energize them in the name of Jesus. A man of God, Elijah, was battle weary and you came down and you fed him from above and you asked him to sleep and to eat and so father in this season we pray i right now for those who are about to weary come down from heaven and energize them feed them and empower them to the glory of your name the bible says and he went in the power of the meal and so lord empower us so that we continue in this journey of life and to continue to emerge victorious so shall it be in jesus most wonderful name we pray Amen. Amen. Praise God. Folks, go out, remain victorious, fight the battle and emerge in Jesus name. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen. sad news that uh, no parent wants to hear that the missing the body of the missing teenager Noah Donoho has been found he's been missing now for a few days and now this very sad news our prayers and our thoughts um, are with the family and, and friends and neighbors who have been helping to look for this child now uh, for a few days we pray that the Lord strengthen the Lord comforts them this time and may the Lord keep them and help them to bear the loss in Jesus name. Amen.